to order. Um, we're just going to do a quick roll call before we get started, just to make sure because we can't see who's on the screen. Brooke? Here. Betty? Here. <laughs> Josh? Here. Brian? Here. Mike Nedler? Here. Mike May? He's here. Yeah, he's here. John Robbins? Here. Georgia? Hannah? She was just on there. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get unmuted. Oh, George is there. Okay. Okay. Kimberly? Here. We have a Oh, perfect. Okay. Great. All right. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. So moved, Josh. Second, John. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Um, public comment. Steve, on the line. Did we lose Dave somewhere? He had told us to let him know to unmute, but I don't know where he went. Dave, are you there? David? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. What did you need? Oh, sorry. Um, uh, do we have any public comment? Hi, folks. If you, um, I see one hand raised. It is a uh, Mark Stringer. One moment, and I will allow you in, sir. Go ahead, Mark. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Stringer. I'm the executive director of the ACLU of Iowa, and I'm offering comment in support of the proposed chapter 103 rules regarding corporal punishment, physical restraint, seclusion, and other physical contact with students. Uh, as you know, uh, the ACLU has been working on this effort as part of a broad coalition for years, and we're relieved to see these changes in the final proposed rules, which are an essential and hard fought improvement in the protections for countless Iowa students and their families. The research makes clear how detrimental the experience of being secluded or placed in restraints is for children. And consistent with these proposed rules, Iowa schools should stop using seclusion rooms and restraints, except in very limited and specific instances. Many key changes that we asked for are reflected in the proposed rules. Those changes are that seclusion and restraints are used only in emergency situations, are no more restrictive than necessary, are used only as a last resort, and are never used for the discipline or punishment of children. We acknowledge there's still work left to do as we remain concerned about disparities in how students are disciplined in Iowa and across the country. Data show that restraint and seclusion are still disproportionately used on students with disabilities and students of color. According to the U.S. Department of Education Civil Rights Data Collection for 2015 and 16, while students with disabilities made up 12% of enrolled students, they made up 66% of students subject to seclusion and 71% of students restrained. Additionally, while black students make up 15% of all students, they made up 23% of students secluded and 27% of students restrained. That said, we strongly support the final proposed rules and thank you. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? Um, Good morning. Can Margaret you hear me? Buckton. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Margaret Buckton from the Urban Education Network and the Rural School Advocates of Iowa. Um, we too are here to show our appreciation for the thoughtful conversation that took many years to get to the seclusion and restraint rules that are before you. Um, although we didn't get everything in there that we had uh, advocated for, there was much improvement over the, the many conversations we've had. And I'm just reminded that perfect is the enemy of good. We think this, this is a good step for students and putting students uh, safety first. Um, and there will be, of course, training needs and other resources down the road to fully implement this with fidelity. And we look forward to working on getting those resources in place. Um, I also, while I'm here, wanted to commend you on the conversation that you had on early literacy, uh, the work session this morning. 
Um, when I'm talking specifically with my urban districts, we're seeing a deep drop in preschool enrollment this year, probably due to the COVID pandemic and also in kindergarten. So when you ask the question of when is the impact of this learning going to bottom out, we think it's a couple of years before we get those children hooked back up to the system and play a lot of catch up because we'll have fewer kids with preschool experiences in kindergarten next year than we had this year. So we anticipate that we'll still see that impact and um, look forward to uh, having a good conversation with the legislature and the department on what we can do to uh, get those supports in place going forward. Um, thanks for all your work and the opportunity to comment this morning. Do we have anyone else? I just wanted to remind the audience that if you use the raise your hand feature, or if you press star six, we can entertain your uh, commentary. There are no other public comment at this time. Thank you, David. All right, Derek, there's your point. Okay, well, a uh, few things to go over and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, one of the main things I wanna talk about first is the role the department has played in approving waivers and the support that we've been offering districts. Um, there is an application process through CASA where the district submits a request it is based upon the district request in terms of the, uh, the timeline. It is approved for 14 days at a time. And um, once the application is submitted, we draw it down. It's evaluated by the department and public health. And then within 48 hours, we're, we're doing batches a day. We are able to get a response back to the district. Uh, there's a letter attached to outlining the timeline and the expectation that all in-person activities are suspended during the time of the waiver. Districts do not have to uh, utilize the waiver for the full the full time period. They can do less, but it gives them permission to count those days as instruction. There are um, many other options available to districts outside of the waiver to help mitigate uh, needs they might have and make accommodations based on student or staff um, concerns. Uh, as they apply for the waiver, they have 48 hours that they can um, go online and count the instruction without before they hear from us. So it's kind of two free days. Um, at any time, they can close on their own. The difference is that with the waiver, they get in count the instructional time, but they can still just close. If they want to just close school for a couple of days because they need to, they can absolutely do that. They can also at any time shift to hybrid, uh, make adjustments with staff, they can close grade levels or classrooms without our permission. What they need a waiver for is if it's a building or a district level closure. We know that uh, the impact on activities is, is important. And again, these are requests from the district to us. We do not uh, contact them or, or make an expectation that they need to submit when it really is driven by the district. Uh, there is a website, a link on our website that we will send to you later that tracks all of the waiver requests. All of the support, supporting documentation is available. And at the top, we've added uh, a box that outlines the current numbers. So if, when we send that to you every day, you can look at this. So as of right now, um, we break it down by accredited uh, non-public. So there's eight active waivers, and that means they are actively in the 14 days of their waiver, and that's 7% of those districts. For public districts, for the entire district, there are 36 active waivers, so that represents 11%. Uh, public districts where it's one or more building, there are 11, and that's 3%. Public districts where it's the entire district or one or more building is 47, so that's 14%. So if you look at all of those, the total currently is 55, representing 12% of our districts. Any questions on that process or what that looks like? When we close it, when the district closes or goes to hybrid, um, are kids then restricted as far as athletic participation? I mean, we close down the school, then we close down the gym. Yes. I guess that's my question. So when it's the waiver, um, we have a sentence in there that is that states all activ in-person activities will be suspended during the duration of this time. If it's um, anything outside of the waiver where they've just closed a classroom or grade level, it's the district's decision on whether or not to suspend activities. Um, 
you know, the general guidance is that if it's not safe to be in person for learning, Absolutely. is it safe to be in person for activities? But that's the district's decision there. Anything tied to the waiver, though, it is required by the state and it is expected. What about hybrid? Do they, uh, if they go hybrid, can they still have? Hybrid is not considered 100% online, so that's different because that means you still have some people in the building learning. Okay. Correct. So it's really for the 100% from our perspective. Then again, but at any time, the district can make the decision to suspend based on whatever their situation is. You know, we are seeing um, for districts that the numbers are really different um, depending on the community. So you might have a high percentage, but it's based on an outbreak in a prison or a long term care facility, and your staff and students are okay. Uh, anecdotally, the feedback we're getting from schools and for schools that do their own contact tracing is not, anecdotally, um, it is not occurring in the school or between the students. It's outside the school. It's when the staff gather after hours or on the weekend. And it's not super spreaders. It's one, two, and three at a time. And that's what they're, that's what we're hearing. Again, this is not a public health statement. This is not official numbers, but this is what we are consistently hearing from the schools. So you might have a really high percentage in your county, but it isn't in the school. So it's up to the district and the community and their boards to decide what's best for them. Um, we have approved all the waivers that have been submitted to us. We try to improve them really quickly. So it really is driven by um, local decision. Can you talk a little bit about, you said, um, like if they just close, they can do that on their own, but the counting days towards instruction. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about counting days towards instruction and then if they don't have kind of days towards the trip, like if they just close, then what happens? Is that like tacked up at the end of the year or what would happen? Yep. So, so what's unique for this year is um, what's allowed in Senate File 2310. And that does allow you to offer online instruction of it count towards your days. Outside of that, um, typically this isn't allowed. You have to be approved as a school. Um, and Or I don't know if there's even other special permission other than being approved as an online provider. But you can, so prior to this year, if you closed school for a snow day, you had to make it up later. So if you close because you just decide you're going to close, you have to make up that time at some point in your calendar. So that's that 180 days or 10,080 hours before June 30th. So it's up for your school to decide, do you have enough built in? Can you add it on at the end? How could you extend time? With 2310, the hybrid or the waiver allows you to count those days towards those hours. So the, like, for example, the 48 hours you have free gives you those two days, whatever hours you would normally have to count towards that time as part of your instructional calendar. So you don't have to add it on later. Um, so it kind of depends on where you're at with instructional time um, and how you want to use it. There's some schools that, you know, it. The, the challenge even to be online might be too much, so it's just easier to close a couple of days um, to allow them to catch up. Um, for others, you know, we've told them you have to have a plan, you have to have the ability to go online, and so they're utilizing that. And it really depends on their staff and their students. So it's, it's there's lots of options to get through the year knowing that it's changing all the time and conditions change. If you're having a, um, several staff that are out and you're able to cover versus if you're not, um, that's what they sort of have to decide, and, and then you know we help them find a way um, forward for a solution that works best for them. So oftentimes we'll say, "Call us, tell us what your issue is. We'll help you work through what options might be best for you." Does that answer that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, that the, yeah. the governor's uh, rule about two parents at a basketball game or two persons at a basketball game, whoever that might be, that's a hard and fast rule. It's, we have nothing, uh, nothing to do with making those decisions. Our local districts don't have anything to do with making those decisions. No, and it's just two tick. It's two spectators right, per right, athlete. Per so athlete. that is correct. That is that is. You know, we have helped uh, answer questions on that, but that is in the you know, November 16th proclamation, um, which extended some of the the requirements that were in the November 10th. So yeah, that is tied to that. Yeah, just as Billy, I went to a football game this fall. And, and um, I have a couple of quarterbacks, and, and uh, uh, one of the districts came and said, we're not using masks. Okay, so, uh, and, the, and the hosting district said, well, then you're not going in our building, which they didn't. They just stayed out, in, you know, outside, didn't, didn't wear masks and so forth. And I assume that's voluntary. You do those things if you want to do those things. 
And, and we've seen districts have different expectations. Um, we've seen districts impose different limitations on fans. Um, right. This, however, kind of supersedes all of yeah. that and is, is a much tighter requirement, yes. Okay, so we will make sure we send that link to you. And again, that's all public and we keep that updated as much as we can. And we've really had to mobilize our team. You know, this kind of started with Amy, Thomas, and Ann, and we, it, that wasn't enough. <laughs> so we, we, we have great people. We have a good process in place because, again, we're trying to be as, as, as efficient as, and as responsive as we can be. Um, what I, I sorry, I have another question. Yeah. Um, I know some schools um, are doing kind of, uh, well, I, my, I have a niece who goes to like a private school and they're saying that, you know, after, and I know that um, a lot of like universities are doing it. So Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, if people are traveling or whatever, they're doing like a week online just so that people can kind of quarantine before coming back everything because people may have gone somewhere, or congregate with families or whatever. Are any districts thinking about kind of shutting down for a week and just kind of going online to kind of make sure everyone kind of stays at home and kind of quarantines before coming back after like a Thanksgiving or Christmas holiday or? Yeah, we're actually, I, we just saw, I saw that, um, I think Cedar Falls and Waterloo announced that the other day because you've got a shortened week anyway. So some districts are making the choice to just extend it, not all, and some don't want to, but we are seeing several of those that it gives you just kind of an additional break in time and an easy point where it's, it's easier for your families. It kind of just naturally fits in. Um, we don't track that, but we have seen that. Oh, okay. yes. It's possible a district might want to go longer in the spring than in the fall. Right. Or, yeah. uh, it, does that make sense? I mean, I, yep. it seems to me this is the critical time now. Hopefully, we have the vaccination by the vaccine by the spring, right? And kids, mm -hmm. kids will be inoculated and we have less of a potential damage. We did even see early on in the fall when schools were talking about their calendars that they were naturally building in longer breaks in December, potentially or around holidays. And again, it really does depend on their schedule. You know, if you're a trimester school versus a, a, a regular semester, you might be able to build in breaks different ways. And so they're just, they're looking at ways that kind of make sense for them, which is certainly allowed within the, the rules that we have. But they would all make their own. They would all make their own, as long as they're, they're meeting that instructional time. We are really trying to help support them do the things that best meet the needs of their communities. And it's quite varied. So we're just trying to help them, help them get there. Um, you know, also at the, at the department, you know, in light of the most recent proclamation, um, we've, we've kind of suspended a little bit of our, as many people coming back into the building, we still have key people here regularly, um, and it's an update on sort of mitigation strategies, but we're trying to be mindful of the bigger, of the bigger uh, issue here and allowing some um, additional flexibilities for staff kind of maybe adjusting some of those expectations in light of the recent the recent shift. So just so that you're aware of that as well. Um, we do continue to evaluate though our staff efficiencies and structures, um, which is an ongoing process and how we can get better. You know, when you quickly pivot to be to go to a different model, you want to make sure you're being, you know, we've been in it long enough that we're doing it the right way. And as we make longer term decisions, what's going to be best. And so we're evaluating that as well. Uh, and I will add you know, having a new organizational structure and having Amy now as deputy director. And that, Dave, we love you too. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to go on to better and brighter things. But um, Amy is deputy director and Shan is deputy director, chief of staff, overseeing kind of programming and internal structures has been a huge um, benefit to, to our teams and just some accountability and how we, we manage our work. We filled some bureau chief positions that were sort of vacant that gives us a better alignment structure. Uh, Seth um, Kabbalah, Kabbalah um, has come back to Iowa from Portland and taken a bureau chief position in an accounting area that was sort of a vacant spot. You know, Thomas is general counsel and we're um, looking to fill his position to replace it. So he's still not doing two jobs, replacing Shan's legislative liaison jobs. So getting those pieces in place as well has been great. Because um, again, this is, this is the marathon and we're in here for the long haul. And I think our role of the department is to provide the best service we can, be as efficient as we can and be as responsible as we can with our money and our, and our resources. Yeah. So yeah, I think you all filled a legislative position before. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be, I would hope so, but I will. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, we have, um, been having some additional webinars on, we have a mental health three-part series that we've done, uh, social, emotional, health, and well-being. Actually, we have one today, correct? 
Is that the mental health one today at three? I think so. I think so. You know, there's only so many days we can schedule it, but because we've recognized this concern with students and staff and we want to make sure we're, we're um, extending outreach and support, it's important that we continue to record these and make them available because it just doesn't fit in everybody's day. But we also want people to know we have resources available to you um, to help address this. Um, there was some question, I think, last time about um, all the different roles that um, the department play in terms of boards and commissions and, and external meetings where the department is represented. So just as a, just some high level feedback for you, we've been looking at this and just for the director that we're aware of, and this list might get longer, there's 22 boards and commissions that I'm supposed to serve on or my designee. So having Amy and Sham, what we're trying to do is what's the most efficient use of that time? Cause that's, that's just not possible. Um, and everybody wants the director and I get that. So we're trying to make sure we have the best representation on each of those. Um, but for external meetings where de the Department of Education is represented, so we're a key part of that group, uh, right now it's 342. Oh <laughs> so, yes. so we're working on that, on whether or not, you know, how can we restructure our time and make sure we're present at, at the right things. But just so that you guys know, that's the scope of the extent of the work that we do and the outreach and the value of the department to the, to the work of others. So I think those are fascinating numbers and we'll continue to work on how to most efficiently manage those with our staff. Are those dictated uh, by legislation in most cases? Is yeah, that, quite a few yeah. of them. Yeah, most quite of, a few of them are. Yes. Have you, have I wouldn't look those? Have, yeah, have you looked at them and say, gosh, we don't need to be there for this we, one? We kind of do that every year um, as to whether or not it's something we want to propose to but i think most people are very passionate about what they're doing and they like to have that um, additional structure behind it in order for the work to continue yeah yeah so so we're trying to be mindful that that piece of it as well um and then um you know we did send you an update on tj yesterday and i'll talk more about that when we talk about that report but just so that you know we're, we're in communication with the family and i'll give you more update later um, other than that, any questions on anything we're doing? I mean, there's so much, but I want to kind of give you a highlight. But is there anything you would like me to report back to you on or anything you would like me to explain further now? No, just to come, I do appreciate the Friday updates that you sent out. Oh, good. Good. That's, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love to get any updates on the mental health series that you have just through an email meeting. Amy, could you have someone just send those to the board now? Could you have someone um, send yes. those? Yep, we'll get those sent to you now. Are they accessible yes. like, later on? Yep. Oh, okay. so, so everything's recorded and posted. Oh. So it, obviously we know people can't always attend, but you can always go back and watch. So okay. we'll make sure we get that to all of you. You bet. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I assume that's a no because I can't see everybody online. So, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, consent agenda. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? Moved. Second. All right. It's been moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The motion carries. All right. Chapter 79. So, um, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, this is tab J in your binder, uh, a proposal to adopt and file amendments to Chapter 79, Standards for Practitioner Administrative Preparation Programs. These were uh, noticed at your August, uh, your August meeting and public hearing was held on September 15th. Uh, no one gave public comment at the hearing, but one commenter was highly favorable to the rules in a written comment, but raised the question of whether or not the rule listing students at risk for school failure was too narrow. When we looked at that comment, the language is statutory. Uh, so uh, 
we didn't feel re comfortable recommending expanding statutory language in a rule. Uh, the other um, key changes in the rule provide some flexibility for student teachers by removing the requirement that the 14 weeks of student teaching be consecutive. Um, eliminating the exam and making it optional to a t practitioner prep program to re require an exam upon entry. That's no longer would no longer be a rule requirement. It would be program discretion. Uh, in light of recent legislation, expands competencies for uh, instruction and support of students with disabilities and aligns the clinical practice standards, um, the knowledge of skills and dispositions with uh, the evaluation standards that will take that you'll consider in the very next agenda item so that there's some coherence between practitioner prep and practicing administrators being evaluated. So those, that's a brief summary of the proposed uh, final rule. Uh, if Dr. Larry Bice is on the line, he can add or correct to anything that I've said. I, I am on the line and there's nothing to correct and I'm available for questions. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> We, we're still, we still have a Praxis exit test. Is that correct, Larry? That is a, correct. Uh, That's correct. That has not changed. And it's still at the 20% percent percentile? That, no, that, that actually changed. How we set the score actually changed last year. Um, the, the 25th percentile requirement came out. Um, again, that was a, a legislative piece. And so now we're required to set the score at the director's discretion. So we look at um, recommended scores. Um, we look at score data. And then we are also required to examine uh, contiguous state scores um, to ease reciprocity. So what we've done is we've aligned, if we had a score that um, was two points higher, a passing score that was two points higher than say Nebraska, then we just made our score the same as Nebraska. Um, so that if a, st a student doesn't have to take a test over again, if they're trying to cross state lines. But that was last year. And that would sort of be across all the disciplines, It'd be for every, not just math or science, so, but for every discipline. That's correct. The would have that option, right? Correct. Your question? Comments? No? All right. Can I get a motion? I would move to approve. We're done. <laughs> Is there a second? Second, John Robbins. All right, it's been moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. The next um, rule before you is tab K in your materials. This is a proposed to adopt and file amendments to chapter 83, teacher and administrator quality programs. This deals with evaluation of administrators. It is a modernization of the evaluation standards uh, in light of some national work uh, aligning Iowa standards with the professional standards for education leaders. Um, this does a couple of things. It makes the standards more global uh, for leadership as a whole, rather than segmenting out, well, this is what superintendents need to know. This is what middle school principals need to be evaluated on. Um, so the standards themselves are more global and flexible and underneath each standard, there will be some criteria or some benchmarks that um, evaluators can look at through the evaluation process. Uh, this was joint work between the Iowa Department of Education and School Administrators of Iowa. Um, my colleague, Matt Ludwig, um, is here to answer any questions as are our partners from SAI in this enterprise, Dana Schoen, and I believe Rorcorn might be available also. So um, people who actually know what you're talking about, or Dana or Matt, please feel free to correct. <laughs> Nothing. Dana, do you want to add anything? 
Uh, no, I just really have appreciated the partnership. As Thomas mentioned, um, we are super excited about the update and the, the real, really the overhaul of our leadership standards. I think they better reflect the complexity of the day-to-day -day work of school leaders and the progressions, the leadership progressions we have designed aligned to each of the respective standards for both the role of principal or and building leader and superintendent uh, capture more clearly a, a picture of what quality impactful leadership looks like with regard to each of the standards. Um, I'm, I'm, our team, we've had a, a statewide representative team working on these and they represent a variety of roles and different areas from across the state. They are super excited. Uh, I tell you, we have our, we have our evaluation instrument in draft um, form and people are biting at the bit to get a hold of it because it really does help promote deep, rich conversations about what next level leadership performance looks like. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to answer any questions and just thank you for the opportunity to be here with you this morning and for your support of this work. And I would just have a question. Uh, could, could you just tell me quickly how mentorship for a superintendent would take place? If I'm a building principal and I'm going to move up to that spot, um, I'm still a principal. I'm still in my school system. Somebody, I need help. I, I want somebody to model for me uh, what it looks like to be a great superintendent. How does that, how does that process work? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So School Administrators of Iowa facilitates a mentoring program that is for all principals and superintendents. And so when you accept that role as a superintendent, uh, you register with us and we assign you a mentor. And that person is an experienced leader uh, who, like, we try to look for someone who has similar demographics, similar uh, district size, so that you would share some common some things in common as well as uh, close in proximity so that when you attend your statewide or your area education agency meetings you would have opportunities to meet there but you would have a, a formalized mentor and then we bring our mentors and mentees together for statewide mentoring meetings twice a year in September and then again in January virtual this year of course and we also provide monthly content that we ask the mentoring partners to reflect on and consider. Um, that content is reflective of the best practices in our research journals, what's happening right now and things they might need to be thinking about. Uh, and then we ask that they touch base once a week um, to with any questions or, or things that they might be facing. And so it's a structured program um, with a one-to-one -one mentor that we have had really positive feedback around. In about a year, is that when you, uh, you have a, a length? It is, thank you. Yes, it's a year long formalized program. And so what we find is after the fact, uh, after they've closed out their official relationship, they tend to remain uh, colleagues long, long after. Just one other follow up question. How are numbers for superintendents now in Iowa? Uh, are, are we able to fill all those positions with quality people? Um, well, I can tell you we have 17, I believe, and Rourke, if you're on, you can help uh, clarify this. I think we have 17 new leaders, and those leaders aren't necessarily all new to the position. Um, we have several out-of-state people that also participate in our program, even though they're experienced superintendents, which I think is really powerful. Um, they appreciate learning all the Iowa acronyms and the, the, way things we do, the way we do things here in Iowa, and it's nice to have a mentor for that. Um, in terms of being able to fill positions, Rourke, I would defer to you. I think you have greater insight around that than do I. Yeah, thanks, Dana, and, and thank you to Bor for uh, your question. Um, yeah, right now, um, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, I think if you talk to the boards and the search firms who are looking for superintendents, uh, we hear that the numbers are down of applicants, uh, but the quality remains strong. Uh, I, we at SAI work very closely with the superintendent prep programs. Uh, Dana and I teach in those classes and we are you know, very uh, closely associated with them. And so I think probably the good news is the quality remains really high from principals looking to go into superintendency. Uh, but as far as actual you know, numbers of people for applicants for positions, 
it's circumstantial, but uh, I would think for the most part, the, the numbers are probably about two thirds of what they used to be maybe as, as early as five years ago. Thank you. Do we know why those numbers are, are down? Is there, is there a reason or is it just? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I think several reasons. I think that the jobs become much more complex. Um, there are fewer jobs out there. Uh, even when I started here at SAI six years ago, uh, at that time, we had about 300 uh, superintendent uh, positions in the state. Uh, now with shared superintendents, we're down to about, you know, 250 uh, right at, uh, with districts, you know, consolidating and, and then other districts sharing superintendents. So I think the position right now is, uh, uh, is a little bit more challenging and, and people are maybe a, a less willing to step up into the role at this particular time. One final technical comment, all of the rules that you adopt and file today will become effective January 20th, except this one. And there was a specific ask that it become effective July 1, so that administrators aren't evaluated under, under different sets of standards within a school year. So, and that will also give some time for some uh, the materials that Dr. Shun mentioned to be completed and folk evaluators to be trained on those. So. Just wanted to draw that to your attention that there's a spe that this particular rulemaking package has a different effective date. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Can I get a motion to adopt? So moved, Brian. Well, All right. Thank you, Brian. It's been moved. Is there a second? Josh, second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank you. The next item is tab L in your binder. Uh, uh, rescind and replace of Chapter 103 Iowa's Rules on Corporal Punishment, Physical Restraint, Seclusion, <laughs> Physical Contact. Being somebody who is at his nature, still somebody who likes to be in the courtroom, I brought an exhibit. And this is the file for this rulemaking process dating from the initial petition for rulemaking. So as the representative from ACLU and the representative from the Urban Education Network and Rural School Advocates of Iowa, uh, I can attest that this has been a long process uh, and a fruitful process and one that's involving many people. Uh, the seven initial petitioners, Disability Rights Iowa, uh, ACLU of Iowa, the University of Iowa College of All Legal Clinic, represented by Professor Len Sandler, and attorneys in private practice, Kurt Sitzma, Edie Bogazic, Mary Richard, David Rostin. Uh, included in that were um, AEA directors of special education, um, school administrators of Iowa, Iowa Association of School Boards, um, Iowa State Education Association, all had representatives throughout this process uh, and forcefully uh, advocated and critiqued along the way. Uh, within the Department of Education, uh, Dave Tilly, Amy Williamson, Brad Niebling, Barb Guy, and Eric Gephardt uh, were leaders of this effort. And I specifically want to commend to your attention the work of my predecessor, Nicole Presh. Um, she needs, she cannot be forgotten today because she was uh, a driver of this process and uh, the project manager of it. Brief comments about the changes between the notice of proposed rulemaking and the, uh, or the notice of attended action and today's rules package. There was a suggestion that the size of the room be changed from 56 square feet to 49 square feet. Um, at some point, safety first, um, you know, there was concerns that 49 square feet, even though the walls are of sufficient width in both dimensions, uh, getting adults into a smaller room would be more difficult. So that's why the judgment, the recommendation to you remains 56 square feet. The fact that schools will have five years or whenever they remodel to expand that mitigates mitigates against 
uh, the concern raised by that commenter. Uh, if a room is inspected, um, because it shall be once these rules become effective, uh, the, the final rule before you has been changed to require schools to retain both not the evidence that the room was inspected, but that health officials and safety officials approved its use. Um, I think that that just sort of closes the loop uh, and you know provides some certainty that this is a safe space uh, for students to be uh, secluded. There was some discussion again in the rule in the public comment period about the quantum of injury, serious injury versus bodily injury. We've had this discussion before. Uh, bodily is a consensus definition. Um, the advocates, including uh, the ACLU of Iowa, continue to uh, commit to the point that it should be serious uh, as the modifier to bodily injury and point well taken, but this is a consensus document and the recommendation is to move forward with the term uh, bodily versus serious. A couple other changes to provide some internal alignment with the rules. Uh, the documentation rule was changed to more clearly reflect the decision making. Re the documentation required in Rule 103.8 was revised to more clearly document the decisions required in Rule 103.7. Um, that was an improvement that was pointed out by uh, commenters from the ACLU. And then the last change is some specific alignment with other law. So when the law, when the rules say, well, consider a health plan or consider an IEP. Uh, one commenter suggested to specifically align with chapter 41, the rules on special education, or chapter 14, the rules on student health and health plans. Uh, so with that, that's a uh, still brief, longer than I would like, but still brief summary of the changes that are before you. I would invite anybody from the department to um, who's participated in this process to um, add or correct. I, I, I will not correct in any way. I think your summary was accurate. I would add two points. Um, one, uh, this process truly was an inclusive, broad-based um, process, uh, which I think is reflected in the fact that this is the third time these rules are before you. Um, no one got everything they wanted. Everybody got much of what they wanted. Um, and, and I think this is a, a good exemplar for how uh, quite controversial content can be processed and a consensus can be reached that, that all parties can, can uh, live with and move the ball down the field. The second thing I would say, um, which I think is perhaps the most important thing about uh, this set of rules is these are good for kids. They're good for kids, they're good for schools, they're good for administrators, they're good for teachers, they're good for families. They truly do uh, represent uh, a major leap forward in um, the use of these practices and procedures for students in schools. And we could go chapter and verse into detail of lots of specific reasons for that, but um, these rules truly do move uh, our practices in the state towards uh, the state of the evidence base and the state of the art in, in use of such practices. So um, I think the, the group can feel very good and proud of the work that they've done. And I, I do think that, that this truly is a, a a benefit and a move forward for the kids of Iowa. Any other um, questions or comments? Well, David, you need to take some responsibility for this too. You did, you're getting, you did a great job with this. You and Nicole both just did a marvelous job, I think, going out and you did exactly what needs to be done in situations like this. You did develop a consensus about this. And, and again, I think you need to take to get some credit for this as well. And I appreciate that. Thank and you, what, Michael. Yeah. The one thing that troubles me is the assessing physical damage. Uh, if I'm in a classroom and somebody picks up a chair and throws it against the wall, is that is that physical damage enough to say that I should interfere or get in that get in between the kid and the, and the wall? Or 
I, that one bothers me. I don't, I don't know that you can change it. I don't know that there's a way to fix that. Uh, but coming at this as a teacher, it is difficult to make that choice and make that decision uh, about what it is I need to get in there and stop from happening. Um, but uh, otherwise, unbelievable. Good job. Great job. Um, Mike, I think Margaret Buckton's comment earlier about professional development and training, and that's the necessary next step. That's going to address a lot of this. A lot of that, like how much is too much, what property is valuable, what property is intrinsically valuable, what property of damage can be weaponized. I think that's the type of, uh, that exactly is the type of thing that uh, Ms. Buckton was alert alluding to, um, specifically the question of from the teacher's vantage point. The rules, one thing that the rules carry forward from the status quo is uh, a reminder to not second guess the reason judgment of a teacher. Just because teacher in the same circumstance, colleague across the hall would have done something different, doesn't mean that you all, that you've done something wrong. And so within reasonableness, there's a range of options and the rules call about call out the concept of reasonableness and being prudent, but not being, but not being perfect, uh, being thoughtful, but not being uh, omniscient. Uh, so that hopefully the uh, training, which begins with the adoption of these rules, there's a substantial amount of information for teachers and administrators if you adopt on the, the rationale underlining each of these changes. This is step one of professional development. And I think prof Margaret's correct that professional development, if it doesn't happen well, this isn't gonna happen well. Uh, well said, Thomas, and I, and I agree with you 100%. I think that is in the training you get an explanation of I can't tell you how many times I've gone home as a teacher at night did I do that right? Did I do that right? Uh, who's gonna, where's the first phone call gonna come from? Uh, to the extent that we can make it very clear to teachers, uh, I think that's that's helpful, but I take it too much time. And I think the inclination of asking did I do that right is the essence of being a professional. And that's um, that's a question that should be asked, but it shouldn't result in paralysis. It shouldn't result in paralysis analysis. But I think that um, the professional development process will be iterative through time as folks learn more about the evidence base and what works and what doesn't. So yeah, thank, you. thank you, Thomas, that's well said. I just wanna thank the team that worked on this, especially Dave and Nicole. I know that you guys worked really hard um, and over several years on this. Um, so I really appreciate you taking everyone's feedback, including the boards um, and stakeholders and going out and listening tours and really taking the time to walk this through slowly and include all the feedback and really think about this. Um, so great job. Thank you for putting so much time and effort into it. I know Nicole's not here, but I'll text her later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would just like to say, I, I think that um, I'm, I know the professional development is going to be a key element. So thank you for raising that point, Mike and, and Thomas. But I, I, I guess I know, um, I think the representative from ACLU talked about how, um, you know, that students with disabilities and students in my, with color are disciplined at a much higher rate than, um, than non-disabled students and Caucasian students. And so I would just hope that the important piece of the uh, professional development would be alongside of disciplining, like if you're going to discipline a child, also take into these, you know, just be mindful of the fact that, you know, there's a cultural competency kind of thing. And are you doing this maybe because this is a student of color or because of disability? Are there other methods or something like that? So I would hope that that's, a, and I'm sure that that will be included, but I just want to be, I just want to say that I'm going on record saying that I would hope that that's something that a thought process that enters into a teacher's mind before they just go and just do it, right? So. Um, is there a motion? I move that we adopt the amendments to chapter 103. All right, is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, those opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. <clears throat> Right, 
All right, I just want to make sure that, yep, Janet is here as a panelist. Are you ready? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay, good. Well, this is the annual charter report. And um, as you can see, uh, it is ready for your approval. Uh, just a couple of points that I'll make about it. First off, um, there are two charter schools in the state as of this year. This data is 1920 school year data. Um, the charter schools submit their own data, um, but I do uh, redact the data if it's under 10 uh, for personally identifiable information. Um, last year, there was no Iowa assessment, so that in that category, uh, there is no data. Um, and then, um, you know, I would say that uh, Storm Lake showed a little bit of impact from COVID. Um, and the other thing that I would uh, comment on is that West Central High School is a very small high school. And so that does impact their data. Um, to, so you can keep that in mind. And in this report, they report on their individual goals. And that's why we take their report because each charter is different and their goals are different. So that that is uh, what I would say about the report. Are there any questions about the report? Um, can I just say one thing quick, Janet? Um, uh, I wanted to remind everybody on the board that um, all you're approving right now is the report. So this isn't saying that you like or dislike anything about the actual charter schools. Um, it's just that you need to see the report and approve the report before we submit it. So. Um, the schools um, actually come to you to get their charters renewed under um, a different process. So I wanted to throw that out there. There's a there's a chart in the in the report that shows the next renewal. Page three shows the renewal. So when they'll come before the before the board to renew. Um, I have some close proximity to Storm Lake, so I frequently see what's going on in Storm Lake since I live in Spirit Lake, and I have again some grandsons that play football and uh, just to, just for you um, anecdotally uh, before the ball game all the players and the whites are a minority in Strong Lake all the boys grabbed arms with each other stood across and we played the national anthem when it was over they read an equity statement Kim and uh, Kim I thought it was really well done I just thought uh, man who could argue with the way that they did this great taste and so I see some good leadership uh, going on there and everything's not perfect, but they do a pretty, pretty good job. This, be, this goes beyond the charter school, I understand. But uh, they're a part of that environment. I think, it's, I think they do a great job. And, uh, I, I was impressed. Thanks, Mike. When Steve's the stars again, and it's, if it's when it's safe, I'll come visit. Good, good. Are there any questions or comments? I have one question. I've been on the board for quite a while, and I don't think I've heard the phrase innovation zone school programs. Yeah, is, there yeah, something, yeah. is there something other than charter schools that could fall under this? I'm, there's I, never been there's never been an application for an innovation zone school, and the kind of a short. The short uh, of that is that those are would be two districts and a AEA that would come together, some combination thereof, and there has just never been any interest in that. And um, uh, I think I think it, one of the reasons is you know you'd have three different boards to work with. Um, there's a there's a part of the application process where the boards have to approve. Um, so it's it probably a little more complex than what they intended when they passed the law, I would guess. Okay, so. thank you very much. Appreciate that. Good question, Mike. I have a question. This is Georgia. I know we just have two charter schools. I mean, are there ever other conversations out and about about um, people wanting to develop charter schools? I always find it interesting. This is talked about you know, during the legislative process, but I, I just never know what type of demand there is or what interest there is in Iowa. And, you know, there's other groups that talk about it externally too. 
I, I usually get contacted maybe once or twice a year asking about the process and I go through it with them, you know, with the code. Um, and it, it's, um, it's kind of a complex process. You have to get your board approved. You have to apply. The, apply, the application has to be um, approved and then it goes before the state board. Um, so that's, I think, part of the, maybe part of it. There's no money, extra money attached to it. Um, you know, that at one time there were, there were some dollars, um, some federal grants, um, but there isn't anymore. And so I think that's part of it. Um, I, you know, I do get inquiries though from time to time. Yeah, just quickly, how does that, how does the funding work for a charter school in Iowa? Do they take the money with them? Does each student take the money with them to that charter school? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, Actually. it's just, it's the same funding. So, same as a regular. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. Um, I just wanted to uh, jump in on um, what Georgia asked, and I think it, it answers part of the question uh, that Mike's asking too. Um, so, Janet does a great job of walking people through the charter process. I think the thing that um, folks find out when they call and ask her um, is how different Iowa's charter law is from a lot of other states, right? Um, so in order to have a charter in Iowa, it's really just a building within a school district because only Iowa public districts can be charter authorizers. Um, so in a lot of other states, that's not the way it is. You can open a charter school that has, doesn't have anything to do with a district. Uh, so um, the funding and um, the authorization and all of that is really wound up in the public school system. Uh, and so a lot of times, uh, I think they just find after going over it with Janet that they're going to go through this process, um, but it's not going to be that much different than being a building. Um, so we've had a couple, uh, like in Storm Lake, that have been, um, have had success and have found kind of the way that they want to do this, um, they found their niche, uh, but others haven't seen the return on um, doing all of those things just differently. So it's just a different law. Thanks for that. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the submission of the Charter Innovation School Zones le Legislative Report. We approve the report. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Right. Mississippi Bend Area Education Agency Accreditation Committee. All right. I um, want to make sure uh, that Bill Decker is with us. Sorry, I'm making sure that he's here as a panelist. So there we go. <laughs> Okay, um, so in your uh, board packet, you should have uh, the executive summary for Mississippi Bend AEA, and then just one attachment. And the attachment will show you, um, get the right screen here. And I'm actually gonna project it so that you can see exactly what I'm looking at. And those people on Zoom can see what I'm looking at as well. screen doesn't want to share those so give me one moment <laughs> Sorry. well um, I am having a sharing issue even though I'm the host of the meeting so I'm just going to tell you what to look at um, I don't want to take up too much time here. So you have the one attachment for Mississippi Bend. Um, for those of you who haven't been on the board um, for um, kind of the duration of uh, our work with Mississippi Bend, uh, the reason that Mississippi Bend has had conditional accreditation um, has been primarily about uh, finance concerns. 
And so uh, they have gone through um, a pretty long process of corrective action. Um, they've had a corrective action plan that is similar in format to what we're doing right now with Davenport. Not similar in corrections, but the format has been similar. Um, last spring, uh, when uh, Mississippi Bend completed all of their corrective actions, they had coaching support and their coaches uh, came to the board and said that everything um, was actually completed, things were looking great. They had one remaining thing to complete, and that was to end the fiscal year with a positive balance um, and then to make, be able to maintain that moving forward. Um, so we had a, a number of things that were corrective actions that they needed to do so that um, they could ensure maintenance and those were completed. Uh, so what you're looking at uh, in the attachment is their ending balance for 2020 is positive. Uh, it's 2.5 uh, plus million dollars positive, uh, which is exactly what we wanted to see. Uh, just want to be clear that that's not audited yet. Um, and it won't be until the spring. And then, of course, with the added um, addition of COVID, we don't know if we could even experience delays in getting audit reports this year. Um, but uh, the uh, state board had decided in the spring that um, you were all going to see uh, how the numbers came in the fall and assuming they came in as projected to be over $2 million positive, um, the department would come to you with a recommendation that Mississippi Bend's um, uh, accreditation be fully restored. So that's what we're coming to you with today. Um, and then uh, Bill Decker is here uh, to just uh, give you a, a few words of update on how things have gone at the agency. Uh, and um, I think he wants to talk a little bit about how they have improved their ability to function without the use of uh, any warrants as well. So Bill. Good. Thank you, Amy. Um, I do, do have a little bit of update on both what Amy was just discussing as well as uh, our warrant situation. I know that the board has had conversation about our use of warrants in the past. So uh, just on the audit piece, uh, our auditors are actually in the process of finishing an audit right now. Yesterday they were in the room next to me all day on in their final visit. Uh, we are working, we were working to try to have a letter for you from the auditors, but because uh, they were finishing it yesterday, we didn't get the letter, but they've indicated to us that they do not expect um, any substantial change whatsoever from the number that's in front of you. And so that $2.5 million is going to be uh, very accurate with the audited number that is, is uh, determined as well. Um, in addition to that, we're budgeted this year, uh, we, we have uh, established pretty conservative budgeting and so, you know, if you would go back and look at previous estimates that were given to you, $2.5 million is a much better result than what we had um, told you. And that's intentional because we've tried to be very conservative so that we would never underperform, that we would only overperform. So right now, using that same conservative um, estimate, we're expected to finish this year with positive $3.6 million uh, if we continue to overperform the way we have the last couple of years, I would expect us to finish this year closer to a positive $4 million. In relation to the warrant use, uh, I, think, I think you remember last spring, we talked about the fact that, that we did not have any extended warrants this past year. So uh, that had been something that a tool that had been used previously. And I told you last spring that we weren't going to use it at, at the end of June this summer and that we would not plan to use those anymore. And we were able to um, do exactly that. But probably for, from my perspective, maybe the, the best news, the most exciting change that we've been shooting for for a long time is uh, actually last week we paid our last annual warrant uh, for this year. And so uh, we did have to use some operating, you know, you know, we've talked about that before that the agency is just like school districts. We don't get state funding from July through uh, mid-September. And so during that time we did um, extend some warrants for this year, but those are actually paid off and we don't expect to, to use any further warrants during this year. So uh, 
you know, I think as you look in the future, I th what you would probably expect to see is some very minimal use of warrants in the, the early part of a fiscal year. Uh, having those paid off at least by this time of the year, if not earlier in the future. And, uh, you know, the, the work that has been done uh, that we've worked closely with the, the department on has got us into a very solid position, uh, not only in the end result of what's being presented to you, but also in the ongoing results of revenues exceeding expenditures well into the foreseeable future. If you recall, we, we did gain access to the Forecast 5 tool, and our Forecast 5 tool would indicate that uh, our positive balance extends um, and and even continues to grow over the course of, of a five-year projection. So excited to uh, give you that report. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the process uh, of reporting to you, you, I think you as board members know, it's been ongoing for a long time, but I will tell you that uh, between the relationship that we've built with the the department, the mentor coaches that were assigned to the agency, and just our own internal work to improve. I know that I can I can tell you unequivocally we're a stronger agency now than we were when this process started, and and we thank everyone for uh, having some confidence in us to turn our agency around financially and to better serve our schools. Thank you very much. All right, does anyone have any questions or um, comments? Uh, Amy, what does the what does the law say about uh, the the uh, obligation of the area agency to not have a negative balance? Is it you can do this for one year? You can't do this for any years? How does that work, Bill? I'm uh, uh, Bill. Just to you too, before I. Uh, listen to Amy, thank you for all the work you did on this. And you guys have come a long, long way, Bill. And I really appreciate that. But Amy, what, what is the law? We approved some budgets here that, that shouldn't have been approved. Is that fair to say? Right, and that's why um, we really brought this to the board's attention and started down this path of correction with Mississippi Bend is um, the board uh, had approved a budget for uh, Mississippi Bend um, that was um, forecast to come out negative, um, which is not, uh, <clears throat> it is not uh, legal, according to Iowa Code Chapter uh, 273, um, to have an AEA budget for something that they know is going to come up negative. Um, and then, and so um, we couldn't allow the state board to approve that and then move forward, right? Um, so we needed to make corrections uh, and make sure that we were getting um, the agency back on track, but also ensuring that the state board wasn't in a position to um, have something like that put in front of them again. Um, even though we understood that um, Mississippi Bend had work that they knew they needed to do, we needed to make sure that we got all of this corrected and put back in the, in the correct place. Um, so uh, they can't have a, a negative balance. Um, and they can't go into a budget year knowing that they're going to have a negative balance. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for your work on this too. Are there any other questions or, or comments? If not, can I get a motion? I move, I, I move that we restore the uh, accreditation, full accreditation. Uh, to uh, Mississippi Bend Area Education Agency. Second. Hey, it's, it's second. Who was the second? Brian. Brian? Brian. Okay. All right, it's been moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. As a side, again, I, I apologize for a third comment here. Amy, what what is our recourse then if if we are brought a budget from an AEA that says that we're going to have a deficit next year? So is the board's obligation then to say no, we don't approve your budget, or what? Is, is that essentially what we do as a board so we don't do this again? I'm I'm just asking. 
Yep, and you did this um, for Mississippi Bend uh, last year uh, when they came in with a budget and uh, they knew that they were gonna have difficulty um, coming out positive. You said, um, actually, we can't approve this <coughs> back with a plan. And, uh, and you have the authority to do that with any AEA uh, because you approve their budgets annually. Now, um, the difficulty with the timeline, I think, is for AEAs and for you, um, they bring their budgets to you in March and uh, those have to be approved by the board by um, uh, May, but I forget which date in May. And so um, Tom Cooley can probably let us know when he gives the SBRC update later today. Um, so it's a tight turnaround um, for AEAs to be able to make adjustments to their budget if, in fact, the state board um, isn't comfortable with the budget. Uh, but AEAs generally are, are planning within their means, and if they know that they're going to have to make up any dollars, they're planning for that, too. And so um, it's a unique situation um, that we face these needs to cut, um, though... Uh, you know, it could happen uh, that someone could face some financial difficulties in the future, uh, and you might have to say, actually, we need you to go back and change a few things uh, before we can approve it. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a question, Amy. Um, what um, should the board be looking at when the AEAs present their budgets to us? We've heard comments about warrants. We've heard comments about negative uh, uh, balances. Are there other things that we should specifically focus on when we see their budget that we have a responsibility for? Yeah, um, so I think that we can actually uh, think through with our finance team, um, with Tom Cooley, about the things that we would look at from a program perspective uh, to think about whether the budget looks healthy and, uh, and this, the same thing from the finance perspective. So I don't think that you've actually been missing things. Um, I think that uh, really, uh, again, um, this is what Mississippi Bend has been through has been a unique situation. Um, the frequent use of warrants is really uncommon. Um, it is something that we can add, but I don't think that it is typically a pervasive issue. Uh, I think that uh, perhaps what we need to do is uh, provide you with just a little bit more narrative uh, to go with the spreadsheet that you're given. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, any more questions? I, I just have one. Is there a resource a person could go to 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 study this besides the code? Is there any summary anywhere, Amy, or what these rules are? I mean, obviously a balanced budget, um, you know, you does some credit facility fill that in or not? I, I'd just like to spend a little time. Um, I believe I have a slide deck from um, one of the past times uh, that uh, Bill was here um, and the coaches that were working with the AEA were here. And so I will find that and provide it to the board since I know we have new members who weren't all steeped in all of that. So um, let me let me find it and I'll send it out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Amy. Thanks to all of you. Congratulations. Thanks. All right, career and technical education standards adoption. We have Dennis and Kale. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for your time today. I'm Dennis Harden, Bureau Chief for Current Technical Education, and with me today is my colleague, uh, Kel Hutchings. Kel is our Education Program Consultant for Applied Science, Technology, Engineering, and Manufacturing, and we're here today to request adoption of CTE standards for the program areas of Applied Science, Technology, Engineering, and Manufacturing. As a refresher, uh, current technical education in Iowa includes organized programs offering a sequence of courses directly related to preparing individuals for employment in current and emerging occupations. 
At the secondary level, CTE programs are organized within six broad program service areas, with those being agriculture, food, natural resources, applied science, technology, engineering, and manufacturing, business, finance, marketing, and management, health science, human service, and information solutions. And this chart just displays each of the six CTE program areas in their corresponding pathways. House file 2392, which was the secondary CTE redesign required all six CTE service areas to develop and adopt content specific standards. Uh, the CTE standards correspond to each service area required for Iowa schools that offer CTE programs. The CTE standards and benchmarks set clear and consistent foundational expectations for what students need to learn in high quality CTE programs across the state. The CTE standards serve as a guide for Iowa educators as they develop curriculum, courses, and classroom activities. In September of 2019, the State Board adopted standards for five CTE service areas. Due to staffing, the standards for applied sciences were not ready for approval. Since that time, Kale has been working to prepare the standards for his respective CTE program areas. I'd like to turn it over to Kale to walk you through the standards for consideration today. And thank you, Dennis, and thank you for your time today, Board. Like Dennis mentioned, when I came on to the department, and it's been uh, just about a year, almost today, uh, that I've been working here at the department um, with the Applied Sciences, Technology, Engineering, and Manufacturing groups. These uh, standards were sort of in a pilot form, um, and they were provided to the state's educators, um, kind of a, a request on a request style basis for utilization within um, their classrooms and the alignment and some of the work that they were doing. And so those had been provided through the website, through other means uh, here at the department for those teachers to utilize. They were uh, piloted during the uh, 19 and 20 school year. And uh, by the time I got to the department, I started kind of tracking down who, who had been using them and what kind of feedback that they could provide. So that feedback was collected from the teachers first. It showed an emerging emphasis placed on some updates for industry alignment and some current technology trends and uh, changes. And some of the, the big things to that, of course, would be um, the continued focus on electricity and electronic instructions, foundations, and uh, parts and pieces like that um, through just about all of the different strands or different styles of programs underneath that Applied Sciences banner. So I then took those updates um, and put them into the standards that you have uh, before you. I also took this information out to business and industry representatives, and those uh, not only included um, companies and, and some of the, the business and industry reps that uh, are, are very uh, Iowa based, but we also looked at uh, companies, different trade associations and different trades unions also were able to see these standards and give some feedback. Uh, we also worked with the community college representatives as well to um, develop some uh, feedback for these standards from them. The regional planning partnership directors as outlined uh, with Dennis mentioning House File 2392 and secondary school administrators. So that was kind of the, the scope of this work and what we were able to um, get for feedback. The baseline of these standards themselves come from a national standards work group, the Common Career and Technical Core Standards. So that's where the baseline of these originated from, uh, which was a project started in 2003 with uh, several updates since. Uh, these standards were validated by a rigorous multi-step, uh, multi-state project led by Van CTE and um, other national organizations. And so they were uh, ran past business and industry, uh, different training institutions, and uh, served as Iowa's baseline for their standards that we are presenting today. 
the standards are based on criteria for industry credentials, certifications, uh, different pathways for that, uh, post-secondary training needs, and general learning philosophies of, again, the current technology and uh, those standards that are widely used in industry and the field. So these pilot standards that are submitted for board approval uh, will provide state and local education leaders and educators with 11 sets of high quality and rigorous standards. These 11 uh, sets basically come from the uh, look in at what is being um, currently offered through secondary and then on into post-secondary uh, training facilities. And so you can see on the screen here kind of our uh, breakdown for these standards and the different uh, pathways or strands, as we call them, uh, for each standard set. They uh, have, again, been um, looked at. They have been modeled along the other CTE standards documents that were created um, a couple you know, years back on um, the same, same platform and that same foundation. Uh, so with that, uh, we will open up, Dennis, uh, we will open up for any questions from the board and move forward. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Do these standards <clears throat> apply to the secondary and post-secondary, particularly into the community colleges? And Dennis, I can I can take that one. Uh, these standards apply to the secondary, uh, post-secondary community college uh, level training um, have their own standards that are adopted through their accreditation process and their uh, technical programming. So is there alignment of any sort between these and what the community colleges in Iowa offer? Absolutely. The focus of this was foundational work. So these standards are heavily rooted in foundational level um, learning outcomes and the, the work with the community college and the contacts that I utilize at the community college set the groundwork for that student to be able to move into that post-secondary training opportunity and have success. Is it possible to gain, uh, uh, Caleb? possible to gain certification of some type through 12th grade without post-secondary uh, training? We are, we are looking very closely at uh, more avenues for this training. Uh, within these standards, the, the intent was to allow for schools that are utilizing, let's say, uh, uh, national certification. Um, NC3 is a, is a coalition uh, a training opportunity through um, some that various schools are utilizing in a secondary level and these standards very much align to that as well. Um, and again, that is an excellent question and something that all of our CTE service areas are looking closer at as we go forward. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I get a motion? I would move to approve, to adopt. <laughs> you got to my finger. Is there a second? I'll second. It's Georgia. All right, it's been moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have our um, state board policy development priorities. Um, and so I think you all, everyone has a draft right there. Is this one the same that's in here? Or are these the same? I think it is. I have one over here, so I wasn't sure if they were, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll swap the one that's in here. I just didn't know if it was like a changed version or something like that. Okay, um, has everyone had a chance to review these? So this is basically based on, and I know Shan worked on these, um, so, um, and Betty and I met with Shan um, and Anne about these. It's just kind of uh, what we have talked about over the last couple of meetings and they uh, kind of took our um, comments and feedback and incorporated them into these. Um, so, 
hopefully you can approve these so we can kind of get them posted on the website soon since the year's almost over. <laughs> 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 um, and we'll have to start working on once for next year, but yes. Does anyone have any, I guess, any feedback for them or anything like that? Does this look okay for you all? Or? Uh, the last, the last one, the, the last line, the all last schools one. will promote physically healthy students. Uh, to me, that's, I mean, I was feeling that's clear. Uh, we're just promoting physically healthy students, or do we want students to be physically healthy? Am I making too much of that? Is that how does that read to you? All students will promote, all schools will promote physically healthy students. I think you need to read the rest of the sentence. Yeah, because it's through these programs. Okay. Through. So through the the PE and the food and nutrition. So I think I think if you're right, if you just pick that piece out, it, it, what does it mean? But I think if the idea is it's tying it to the programs that they're promoting. Okay. Does that help? That's my English teacher response. Yeah, to me it's, <laughs> it's, okay. that, it's all right. Yeah. I, I understand there, what you mean. It just seems to me it was. Yeah. Is there another way you'd, you'd like to? Well, we could say physical physical health among students. I mean, it's you know something that we would promote okay. physical health. You know, uh, a minor student body and through structured programs or whatever. But I, I can live with it if, if everybody thinks it's okay. Does anyone else have any comments on that last sentence on the page? It's an easy enough change. So yeah, we're going to be posting yeah. it on our website. Yeah. Does so. anyone um, care either way, or anyone have any strong feelings? Or I don't care either way, but we also the et cetera could also include wellness programs that schools are required to do. Yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> So physical health for students, and then add wellness programs. Is, do you feel better about that? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Everybody is there, okay. Well, sorry. Is there a difference between promoting and developing social, emotional, and behavioral health and physical health within students? What was the choice there to use promote? Because I think, like, when I think of promoting, like promoting is saying, "Hey, this is what you should be doing." versus developing them and within students. But I don't know how many people are gonna look at it that closely. Uh, I think that's a good thought. Yeah, I, I, I look at it as right. kind of like encouraging, yeah. like promote, you know, promoting, so like encouraging, guiding. Maybe not in this, guiding might be a little bit strong, but. Yeah, it was just a thought. I didn't know what the choice, like what was the decision making yeah. process promoting versus developing. Is there another way you would like us to, you, I think you mentioned something else, sorry. Yeah, can you, is there, is there another way you'd like to, to see that read? Well, I, no I didn't, I mean, promoting versus developing. I didn't know if developing oh, okay. might, might be a better word to use there, okay. but it's up to you guys. What do you guys think? Do you think that... I think honestly, that's up to the board. So I, mean, I think I mean I'm okay with. Are you are you okay with that, Mike? Sure. I know this is a, sure. one I, of the areas that you're. I think your point is well taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hadn't really thought about that. that I agree. Yeah, you know, I'm okay I mean, with that. Yeah. So right. that says so it would say all schools will develop physical health for students through it's at all of it and then adding wellness well, programs. Okay. How for, is that? I mean, all schools will develop physically healthy students. Um, would work and then all schools will create environments that promote I mean I don't know I mean either either of them works I just didn't know um, why we chose that word over developing so and do you want so are you looking at um, sorry um, are you looking at goal three and four or yeah just, just okay. both of them yeah oh okay okay sorry oh, I see. yeah so um, change promote and three and four to develop, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, okay. so you just substitute develop on that third line. Is that right? Yeah, and then on the, yeah. Sure. So the third goal and then the fourth, because they both use um, promote and the third and the fourth goal. So we can swap those two up and put develop both of those. You got those, yeah? Yep. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. And then you got the like changes too? Yes. So, Anne had already read it, so it would be all schools will develop uh, physical health for students, and then all of the ending, and then add wellness programs to it. Okay. And then goal number three would have all schools will create environments that develop social, emotional, and behavioral health. Is that correct for both of those? Yeah, does that sound okay? Yeah, all schools will create environments that promote social, emotional, and behavioral health within, 
and students and then develop physically healthy students. Thank you. Sam, I would just raise this issue with you. Uh, and that is the board can have all the priorities and goals that it wants. Those aren't coordinated with you and they're not uh, priorities in the department. It hardly does us any good to waste this exercise of time, taking, taking your time. So, um, Ann and I've had this discussion with previous directors. Okay, so where does the department fit in to the board's goals? How do we, how are we congruent in terms of what, what it is we're doing as a department and as a board? Well, I think one thing, um, Amy and I have had this conversation because we've talked about as we look at um, kind of how we measure the work of our bureaus and, and, and the different divisions, what, what is it aligning with? Like, do we always have a consistent mission or vision? So as we talk about how board goals will align with our programming goals, I think that's where we can make sure that uh, they match. So we think about what we want to prioritize and what we want to make sure we're providing support on that they're the same. So, and I don't know how that has been done but we have just had conversations about how that is going to be done going forward. So I think that would be an easy way to parallel that. Is that, am I saying that right, Amy, based on kind of what we've talked about? Yep. You can see what I'm, you can see what I'm asking. Right. Yeah. I, I hardly think it's worth taking hours of your time for us to have goals and priorities, unless in fact we're congruent. Yeah. That, that, that we're pushing in the same direction and trying to do the same down. things. And it, and it fits in well also with what we're doing when I talk about how we're trying to review some of our, our kind of our focus and efficiencies that we're not just doing a whole bunch of things because they sound good. What do we, everything should check back to something, to the why, and that's what we're trying to get cleaner on. So I know um, as she's starting her deputy director role, trying to line some of that, and this is a very natural connection that Shannon and Amy can both work on to make sure um, you know, there's lots of things that are important, but let's prioritize things that tie together that match this vision and match what we're, what we're seeing with, from schools too. And lots of times where your guys' goals, your priorities and goals are coming from is what we are presenting to you on a regular basis. So then you guys, it comes on your radar that, hey, this is a priority and this is something important. So, I mean, I think it, it just in that process that intertwines our goals and priorities with your goals and priorities. What is the equity statement goal? Is there something that we have to vote on also? The, uh, the equity statement? Yes. For the board? Yeah, I mean, that is something that I think that we should put on, yeah, separately. But I would, I have it in our, um, I would have a separate equity, I mean, I guess this is just my opinion. I would have a separate equity statement and then the goals and priorities. And then would we put the equity statement for the state board? Can we have that on our website as well? Yeah. And then we can put that on our website, I think. Yep. Okay, so that has that's, that's separate and it, it's in the future to vote on. Did I'm I get sorry? that right? It's separate. It's separate and it would be in the future to vote on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's yeah, just we'll just make sure it's on the uh, on the agenda. Yeah. And, yeah. Is it something separate. you guys typically vote on? The, uh, the state equity statement? We've never had one. Well, yes, so are we voting on these? Whole thing. You're voting on the priorities and goals, but she's talking about a separate, I think, equity statement that you guys are wanting to put on your um, web page. I don't think you guys have voted on that in the past, have you? I don't think we've ever had one in the past. Yeah. Oh, okay. But do you think we would need to, I mean, I, I mean, I think that we need to present to the entire board before okay. we put something on the website and right. have us like have consensus. I don't know if it's like needs to be a board action, but I mean, I definitely think we need to like discuss it and make sure it looks okay before it's on our website. Okay. Because I don't want to represent, you know, the whole, I want yep. to be representative of everyone's views and everything. I'm sorry. I did put in September, just FYI, to the board. Equity statement. I can't. I, you cut out. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. I did present it to the board um, in September, but I can do it again. No problem. Yeah, I thought that you were doing some revisions to it and then going to bring it back. Is that was I, I did. That? I, okay. I I made the revisions and I sent it out. Yeah, I guess the question is, what's the process? Because I, I I think it needs to be on the agenda. Okay, thank you. All right, got it. Yep. So once it's on the agenda, then we can discuss it as a full board, and then we can vote on it, and then it can go on the website. So it should be put on the agenda for next month. Yes. Yeah. Kim, did you hear that? We don't presume. We need to get in January, right? Yeah, so well, for January, we can put on the agenda for January. Okay? Yep, got it. Okay, sorry, I didn't know if you could hear me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have, a, I have a question. Um, ensuring equity in education on our draft. Um, the first, third, and fourth goal seems to me is very measurable. The second goal to achieve equitable outcomes. Um, do we know how to measure when we have achieved equitable outcomes? My concern might be that instead of achieve, to promote equitable outcomes. I, um, the discussion when we created that, the discussion of that metric was like the condition of education report is what we would default back to. For, for measurable kind of. Okay. So, to see whether we've achieved, because I think it has to keep on coming back to whether, because I think if you're just saying promote, then I think that that's even harder to kind of, you know, how do you know if you're really promoting it or not? I think that if you're, I agree. I think that it has to be tied to something though. So like a measurable kind of, you know, like something that you're watching every single year, is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, do, I we, agree, yeah. do we know how to measure this yet? Yeah, so, it's, the, it's the conditions of education report, right? Right, you have the, you have the achievement scores, um, um, time follow up with the discipline. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know that one that, and okay. they break it down by subgroup. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's presented to us once a year, so that's what, yeah. It'll be presented today. It's, yep. it's presented yeah. today on the agenda. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> on, a, on a related note, since we're talking about equity, I noticed that our last item on the agenda is, is equity. And if it's a, a priority for our, for this board, I would hope that we would start to move that up in the order of, of the agenda. So you know, very last awesome thing we talked about. Mm -hmm. no, no, I agree. We, we, we bumped up Davenport um, because what was happening is that was always at the end and there was the action on it. So it was not intentional. No, I, we I'm bumped just, it up, it got shifted down, but yeah. absolutely noted. I would just, uh, ask a question too on improving teacher and leadership prep. The last goal of all educators and I will be prepared to provide effective instruction through both in person and distance learning formats. May I ask what we're doing to promote that within the department? Um, and are the AEAs focused on that too as well, Shannon? Is that is that something that's going on in the AEAs to, to help with that? With the distance learning, you're talking I about that is one of the most relevant mm -hmm. issues that we could deal with uh, in, in promoting education right now. I'm scared to death with this third grade, the literacy issue and uh, or, or K3 right. literacy issue, but I'm sure concerned about this one too, that quality instruction is actually getting out to our kids with these hybrid models and all the things that we're doing. I agree. No, Have we done, are we doing a presentation on the online platform? I mean, because the, the AEA certainly have an online platform that they are working on. The department has, we have, have we done a- Is okay. that the same? Is it, are you using the same? Platform? There's actually some variations and I think it's it's designed to be able to give districts more choice. Okay. How they want to utilize for their, um, for their online learning. You just say that's a priority for AEAs right now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. so so the way we sort of parsed it out in the short term was that the AAs were focusing on the PD for the for the teachers while we were doing, building the the plat um, paying for the platform, making sure they had access to that, and then working on the content. As we go forward, as part of that e-learning central, it'll expand a little bit, and, and that continues to be a priority because it's, you know, it's not going to go away. It might look a little bit different. So. I think what we may want to do is put on the agenda an right. update on that process, um, what it's looking like with the PD offered through the EAs, what other support is being provided for that instruction, and what we um, identify as needs going forward. So I love to see that. that. I love to see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll get that back to you next yeah. time. Okay, yeah. That's a great question. Right, does anyone have any other um, feedback or comments or anything on on our priorities and goals? No, I think that looked good. I would just add, it just as a follow-up, is that as we go throughout this year and into when we reassess these goals, how how will we know that there's been progress made? Can that be somehow boiled down and, and concise as far as a report back to the board as far as how things are going with these goals? Um, okay. A lot of them are achievable. I'm, I'm just talking about maybe an executive summary, a paragraph, or, or whatever, as far as 
this was the progress that was made. Here are our challenges, here are the opportunities. So we have some type of idea as far as, did we make any progress? Did we make any difference? I like the idea. I think that's a really good idea. And I think that would be something that would be great to do maybe in May. Um, because then when we go into our retreat, we usually kind of, you know, discuss these um, a little bit. So I think that would be nice to have that going into the retreat, knowing kind of which goals we made progress on, where there were challenges and things, because we always kind of come into it and we all have to like kind of figure out where we are and, you know, and then like which ones do we want to keep, which ones we think we are, you know, so it, it would be nice to have that before the retreat. Okay. I think. So when does assessment data come in? I mean, when would, will we have that that uh, that data that we learned from uh, Iowa systems would begin in March, right? They would begin in March. Is that? Mm -hmm. do, do you know when, schools, March, April. Amy, do you know when the data yeah. will be back in the spring assessment? Yeah, you're not. You will not have the Iowa assessment data back um, for your June retreat. Um, I think that there's some potential that that Jay might have something preliminary, but that's risky to start thinking about preliminary data. What you will have is. Um, we will have um, the fall, winter, spring screening data, um, and we can pull together some other pieces of information that we would have. Um, as for measuring, you know, all of your goals, I would just offer that <clears throat> we have aligned our division goals to the board goals, so they're not always exactly the same, um, but they're aligned, and we will be um, determining what our measures are. So we'd be happy to show you exactly how we're doing that and then what we're measuring so that we can just report to you on those measures so that you don't have to do the work of coming up with measures that you want to see. That works for you. And we did have some conversations too about, we kind of go through this every year, like you said, we're wordsmithing these goals and then how are they actually being implemented? How are they being used? And so we have had some conversations as to whether or not it's something that the board should take a look at and figure out, is, is this what you guys want to do every year? Is this the process we want to go through and how can this be more efficient and work towards, you know, um, be a proactive approach towards the work that you guys do as state board members. So this is certainly, I think, a process that you guys may want to take a look at and see how beneficial it is for you as state board members at some point. Yeah. If we could do this, is there typically a June retreat? Or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I know this year with COVID, we didn't do our, usually it's a day and a half. So it's like an all day Thursday and then a half day on Friday, like a morning. And we we'll usually take a substantial amount of time to go over our goals and priorities um, and strategic plan. So I think that, you know, Chandra, we've had some conversations about is that the best use of our time because we could use the retreat, you know, for so many other different things, you know? Um, so I think that's something that we can kind of talk about before and as we're kind of planning. We usually have like a planning committee for the retreat just to see kind of what we want to focus on. Um, and. I think that's good to kind of review and make sure that we don't want to make any changes or anything, but I don't know if we need to spend like the entire day and a half on these goals. And we usually have a, a, a short like business meeting too, maybe a yep. couple hours on Friday morning, I think. That's correct. But the majority of time is usually spent on, on this, so. Um, I'm just going to add in that I really like the work that has been done, especially under the Preparing Learners for Tomorrow's Workforce. Um, priorities and then the creating a safe and healthy and welcoming learning environment. Um, I've been really interested in the way that we've changed those and I've been appreciative of that. And then the equity work, I know that students, part of the equity committee, were really involved with that. Um, and so they are coming up with ways that we can possibly measure it. But I'm really interested to see, especially for the tomorrow's workforce priority and then the safe, healthy and welcoming learning environment, how students can get involved in that process and how the Department of Education can constantly be working with students to um, find ways to meet these priorities. Um, and I have some ideas about that, um, if we would be able to talk about that at a later date and time too. Good, great. Thank you, Hannah. All right, so I think we have to, do we have to vote on these? Yeah. Okay, does anyone have any other questions or comments about these? All right, is there a motion? Is it as amended or, or yeah, it have to be as amended and then we'd make those changes before we yeah. um, I'll move that we approve the priorities as amended. Second. Okay. 
All those in favor of voting on the priorities as amended? Say yes. Aye. 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 Okay. As opposed? All right, the motion carries. And so what I'll do, um, Brooke, is I'll make these changes, then I'll run it past um, you and Betty again, and we can make sure that we've got final, final, and then we can get them posted on the website, on your guys' webpage. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. And thanks for your work, too. I know you do. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah, this takes a village, so lots of, lots of work on this, <laughs> Nate Tilly and Jeremy, and yeah, lots of work on it, so thank, but you. thank you. Thank you, Sam. All right. Good job, Sam. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So we have on here noon for lunch and board reports, and it does seem like oh. there's a little bit of a challenge when we eat and talk at the same time. Do you want to give <laughs> 20 minutes just to eat and then turn it back on for board reports, or do you want to just eat and talk all at the same time? I don't care either way. What do you, what do you want to do? <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Doesn't matter. What if we uh, took kind of a clean break and at 12.10, came back we can share board reports and then and then because Davenport is at 12 30. do we have 20 minutes worth of board reports or should, or do we want more time for lunch we can do those right now oh that's a good idea but do it now okay. Okay. Do right now and then go eat yeah. right, go ahead. Um, i don't have a lot to report i just tell you that i have been in numerous districts uh, over the past uh, couple months uh, i've seen a lot of activities i've been in schools uh, Seems to me schools are handling what they're doing pretty well. I think we're uh, we're doing a good job. I, what worries me the most, I think, is is what kind of learning is taking place. Uh, if we're using uh, hybrid patterns, or even if we're just in a school setting, um, trying to protect kids, uh, I, it concerns me a great deal uh, to, to to actually be able to assess what's going on and, and to be uh, confident that uh, all uh, 300 plus districts are getting the job done. I think it's a, it's a work in progress. There's a lot of movement going on, but I really appreciate the conversations I'm having with superintendents, principals, teachers. Um, and uh, I, I know that a, a good faith effort's being made uh, to really serve kids. And uh, it's, it goes on. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of things. I've had conversations with educators as well, and I think they're doing the best they can do under the circumstances. Uh, my concern is that I'm not sure how long this effort can be sustainable. I think that uh, the announcement of a vaccine kind of shed some little ray of hope, but knowing that that's going to be you know, down the road as far as its impact is concerned. So I, I would just hope that as we go about our business and work with others in the field and, and other public reps that we really encourage uh, parents and students and community members to show some grace for our educators, you know, they talk about frontline nurses and health professionals, and I 100% agree with that, but we have frontline educators, too, who are, who are doing the best they can under difficult circumstances. And second thing I want to report on is that I, I did uh, serve as a lead evaluator as far as a school accreditation visit in Pender, Nebraska, and uh, there were Five on the team, including me, there's three from Nebraska and one uh, lady from Selma, Alabama on this review. A very small school, 400 kids, and very <laughs> award-winning school. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get on site. Everything has to be done remote. And when you can't get on site and get in the classrooms, it, it really is a challenge. Uh, but I have another one coming up. In the spring in Nebraska, and I'm also trying to get on one outside of the Midwest and hopefully international. So that's kind of what I'm oh, doing cool. behind the scenes. Great. Did you, and you attended the NASB conference and the- Oh yes, uh, I did that. Yeah, that was, the yeah. Yep, uh, that was my first NASB. It was, it was interesting. I, uh, it, I thought the format was about as good as it could be. You know, yeah, like, but, yeah, usually it's not like that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, it was, it was very, very informational. I know I saw Brooke and Hannah and uh, Betty were in attendance. I'm not sure who else was in attendance, but that, that was that was good. Just, just as a follow-up to your comments, um, as we look at a vaccine, teachers kind of the front line of, uh, as well as health workers, because they should be. Uh, the folks that are in the classroom taking care of our kids ought to have a priority. Old folks like me, I would, I would gladly give up any vaccine to a teacher. Uh, I would much rather do that. But have you 
heard any any comments about that or any uh, are, are we willing or are, are we uh, uh, do we have a plan in place so I, I know that there is kind of a deployment plan being worked on by public health and so I can certainly share that information with them you know as a as a point of consideration um, I don't know to what extent it's been released yeah. or the details but they they already are working on what that would look like and um, for the when the time comes okay, so you. we'll pass that along. Yeah, thanks sorry to mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that TJ should be, you know, hopefully one of the first people to get that. I mean, I would hope that, yeah. All right, sorry, John, were you done? Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to go yeah. next? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, well, I also attended the NASB conference, and um, I've attended it in person as well, uh, John, and it really is much more fun in person, but um, <laughs> there were some amazing speakers, and one that I just wanted to mention is, um, I'm not sure I'll say his name right, uh, Ibram Candy, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, and um, a Dr. King, and they were on a panel together, and two takeaways from that, one was that um, state boards should ask themselves a couple of questions. One is, anytime we talk about policy or rules, we need to ask ourselves, how does this affect equity? Will this reduce social injustices? Will it increase? Is it neutral? That's something that we should look, use that lens every time we talk about a policy or rule. And, and I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, not sure how we do that, but uh, very, very important point. Um, they, the, the whole panel uh, discussion revolved around the concept that equity is not just an issue of justice, that it is part and parcel of education as well. And um, I, I just thought the, the session was excellent and, and I wish every one of us could have heard it because there's way too much, way too much to report than what I can in this little bit. Um, but along those same lines, I also participated in the 21 Day Equity Challenge, which was sponsored in part by the Greater Des Moines United Way and Greater Des Moines Partnership and a whole bunch of other partners and I can't remember all of them. Um, and so many resources, there's no way I could possibly have read or, or viewed all of them, but they were very enlightening. And I would encourage you, all of, all of those sessions are um, online. And I would encourage you, if you have a moment, to look up the 21 Day Equity Challenge and look at some of those resources um, because they were amazing. They put together some amazing programs. And then the other thing on kind of a fun note, um, Marshalltown schools have gone to um, totally virtual learning right now, and I have a granddaughter in kindergarten. Mom's a nurse picking up extra shifts because of shortages, and so grandma got to do um, online education yesterday with the kindergartner. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, that teacher was absolutely amazing, and I'm sure they, all of them out there are. It, there, there were some, so many positives and yet so many frustrations that for me that I, I just hope this doesn't have to go on very long. You saw students who were, who were very engaged and you saw students who she could barely, barely reach. And in the classroom, she would have been more able to do that. You had some kids whose screens froze, didn't know how to unfreeze them, even though she would tell them. You had some kids who didn't know how to turn their mics on but you had some who did it, you know, who grasped the technology just like that. Real disparity in, in how the students in kindergarten managed um, the technology. My granddaughter, who, so, so they did an, an hour of on, online and then she had um, some uh, work that she had to do on her own and she's pretty self-directed. And so it was kind of fun to watch her. But I talked to her a little bit about it and, and a couple of things she said, um, yeah, I really miss my friends and I really miss seeing Miss Eggers. And she said, this is not fun. And I said, no, I'm sure it's not, SD. And she said, but school is fun. I love school. <laughs> so there you have it, the words of a, from, the, from the mouth of a kindergartner. It was an interesting experience and one that I'm really glad I had, saw firsthand. 
Thank you, buddy. Everything I needed to know in order to kindergarten. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right, who wants to go next? Yeah, that's great. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I could yeah, go next. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. All right. So I have to agree with John on how long the efforts can be sustainable because, um, but then also like the quality of education, like right now, I think teachers are working, they're working tirelessly, they're working as hard as they can to give us as, the best education as possible. So whether we're in person or whether we're working online, I think that the quality of education that we're getting is really good. Um, but teachers are working long hours trying to get that um, for us constantly, um, answering their emails and things like that. And so I don't think it's very sustainable, but what I'm concerned about is that the quality of education is as good as it's going to be right now. Teachers are working super hard to do that, but students, um, if their social and emotional health isn't kept up, they're not gonna be able to get this learning as quality as possible um, and really partake, participate fully in it. And so I think that worrying about the quality of education that we're getting right now is important, but more importantly, it's the social and emotional needs of students. There are students who are doing online schooling. I mean, I'm doing online schooling right now because I'm quarantined again. So I'll be quarantined for a total of a month if I don't get quarantined later down the road. Um, but I'm doing online schooling. I wake up at eight, I start get on my computer and I don't finish my work until five o'clock. There's students who are on other districts that I've talked to where they're working. They have an hour long class for each of their classes where they're on their Zoom calls and they have to be participating in that. And then they have two hours of homework for each class and maybe they have six classes that day. And so students are just overwhelmed and they're getting loaded with all of these work, but they're also not very socially and emotionally stable and they need a lot of help with that right now as well. And so they're already overwhelmed with this amount of schoolwork that they're doing, but they're becoming more and more dysregulated as COVID around us just kind of disrupts our lives. Like there's people on sports teams who will find out that one of their friends tested positive. And so for the day that it takes for them, it's just kind of a crisis. And that's all their mind can focus on is, will they test positive as well? How are they gonna go and get a rapid test? How much money does the rapid test cost? And it's just kind of consuming your mind. And so students really need this, all the support that they can get as far as social and emotional learning so that they can participate in school fully because right now school is, we're getting as good a learning as we can and students need to be able to focus on it, but it's not what's at the front of their minds right now. Um, and so involving students in any way possible that we can to make sure that they get the support that they need for social and emotional resources and mental health resources is really important and making sure that students are supported in that way throughout the year. But then also um, with the election, um, students have been organizing across the country as the Secretary of Education is going to be selected um, and what the new education at the national level looks like. Um, and they're really pushing to get students involved in that process. And once the, it is select, she is, or they are selected, um, how can students continue to be involved in shaping education at a national level? Um, and so that's like students on committees and students um, helping select the um, sec new secretary of education. And so I'm just thinking about how we could bring that back to Iowa. And so whether that's in area education agency or in the Department of Education, how we can get students involved in the day-to-day -day, um, work that's in that, how can we consult with students? Um, so having students on committees, that's something that I'd really like to see a push for. Um, within the Department of Education because one student on the Board of Education cannot in any way represent all of the voices of students in Iowa. And so getting a good diverse group of students who aren't typically, maybe not typically your greatest students who always talk positively about what's happening in schools, but the students who will force us to think differently about what needs to be done in school, getting them involved with the Department of Education and the initiatives that are happening across the state. Uh, so those are my updates. Uh, yeah. Wow, thank you, Hannah. Um, I can say, Hannah, I agree with all your comments about students and making sure. I mean, it's, I just think about it, me as a parent. I was thinking about this the other night, you know, what else could I be doing even? You know, you think your kids are all right and they're sitting there watching their classes. And I just, I think, what else could I be doing to make sure yeah. that you don't realize how much they internalize and are thinking about all the things that you outlined? I thought those are, were great points. Thank you. And I mean, right now, I'm usually somebody who's always going and getting, trying to get as many things done as possible, but it's been hard for me to keep up 
on my schoolwork this year. I mean, there's been times where I just come home and I just plop on the couch and I want to watch TV. I mean, I've done that for the past two weeks and just only doing what I have to do for schoolwork because I'm so mentally drained and exhausted um, and worried about the other things that are going around, on around me. So I think it's really important that students get the support they need and having a caring parent is always yeah. helpful. It's funny you say that because my, my son, and I, I won't, but I just want to give you the parallel. He keeps playing his video game a little bit more. Now he plays more like interactive with other people, which then started to really frustrate me. But then my mind went to what you just said. It's like, I think he honestly uses it a little bit more as a release for other things. So that, that's a great point. Well, Hannah, I'm sorry you're in quarantine. I hope that you don't have to stay in quarantine for a month. That sounds miserable. You know, I, I think that um, along, I know we talk about teachers and just the mental, you know, I mean, the mental health of our teachers, our students. I mean, I know that me as a parent, I'm so happy that, you know, my son is in preschool and I get to drop him off every single day and he goes and he has a fantastic time. But every single time I get an email saying that, you know, there's been a COVID, you know, a student that tested positive. Um, you know, they email us just to inform us and they say that, you know, you, you're, he wasn't like caught, you know, he wasn't, he was in a separate section. He had no contact, blah, blah, blah. And I'm always like a huge sigh of relief because I mean, it just means like, I, I, I can't even imagine, like it goes through my mind, like, oh my gosh, like what do we have to do to lock down our household if we have to go into quarantine? Like that is just like, I can't even imagine. I know it's going to happen, but like, that to me gives me so much anxiety just to even think about that and not really be able to go anywhere for two weeks. Like, you know, I just, I can't. So I, I don't even know what you're going through, but I hope you can get out soon because I have actually a friend who she lives in New Jersey and her entire family tested positive. And so they were on lockdown for two weeks and couldn't go anywhere. And she said she was going stir crazy. I felt so bad for her. Stuck at home with three kids and she said she was really, really tired and I felt so bad, you know, so. Um, but yeah, but thank you, Hannah. Thank you for your comments. I absolutely agree. You know, and maybe looking at, I know that, uh, I don't think that a lot of um, school boards, like school districts, I don't think that they have um, student members or I don't even know if they've ever yeah. entertained that like PA boards or anything like that. So that might be, you know, good conversations to have of just have they even thought, I don't even know if they thought about, you know. No, definitely. I think students on boards is amazing and also getting like committees of students to work with the school boards as well. Um, and I wonder what role the, the Board of Education and the Department of Education could um, play in encouraging students to um, be on school boards. I know there was legislation last year trying to get passed, but it kind of got shut down with COVID of requiring a student to be on every school board across the state. Um, and so there's a lot of really great work being done. But I appreciate all that you had to say about the two-week quarantine. Um, and it, it really sucks. The worst part is not knowing whether what you're going to be doing. And so once you get those yeah. test results back, usually it's more manageable. But students yeah. on board would be something that I'd like to see what we could do at the state level. Yeah, absolutely. If we could uh, divide Hannah into 300 plus. <laughs> 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 all, all That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> cool. We could just quote Hannah, right? <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. All right, who wants to go next, Brian? I, uh, I think I made my comment probably during the report session and when uh, the work session about the community foundations. I really think that. There's a big interest up here in Dubuque about the third grade reading and the, you know, it's kind of cliche, but learn to read versus uh, read to learn and how important that is. It's really caught on. So if there's any way that we can tap into that somehow and bring more people to the table on these issues about grade level learning and third grade reading, you know, it really caught my eye when I heard a speaker talk about architects using third grade reading scores as determinative of how big they should make prisons. Um, so there's a lot of statistics out there about things like that and zero to five learning and, and things like that. So I, I think there's, I don't, and I don't know that we already have a relationship, but my understanding is that things like the community foundations are collaborators and try to bring parties together. They're doing it more locally now with school districts, but maybe we can, you know, tap into resources and tap into information and get some more people involved in these very important issues. 
That's really that's good all point. I really, yeah, really good point. And I, and I think, well, we know every county has a foundation board. I mean, every county does. They have to. Uh, so, and, and certainly in a lot of counties, there are multiple foundations that could provide that help. But certainly true in Dickinson County. I know. Uh, so I really appreciate your heads up on that. That's good. Yeah. I also think, Brian, like United Ways, too, around uh, the state, same thing, yeah. are engaged in that work as well. But I totally agree with you on the community foundation work because we were in connection with them on several things and they all are interested in this space. Kim? Um, I had a really good, can you, um, I have these earphones. Is it, is the audio okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right, so uh, we have our equity committee. We have 17 members and 10 of them are students. And we do have, about two students that have been invited to their school districts to give student voice. So um, there's a little bit of activity around the state for that. Um, we had the students in October went through an, a student orientation and Amy and Shan uh, participated in uh, just basically shared about how to take more interact with the Department of Ed and that was a really good orientation. So tonight at five, we have another meeting and we'll be focused on those two those two first goals that we just um, voted on amendment, the equity in education and also the opportunity gap. Uh, we I also participated in a 21 day equity challenge. It was really, sometimes it was just hard to read, but I, I, I pushed myself uh, to read it. Sometimes it just, you know, it's just tough, it's just tough. But it, it was very informative, I learned a lot and um, I was able to, even email Becky, like, but I knew that Betty was doing it. Well, Betty had asked me, it's so funny, one day she said, hey, are, um, I'm participating in this challenge. I said, so why am I? So it was great to just share learnings between the two. So Betty, thanks for reaching out. Um, and then uh, I, last week I spoke on Drake's panel with the South Central STEM Hub. I used to be on that board um, years ago and they had a, and I was able to participate with um, the past director, Dorothy Wise. And we just talked about, uh, it was mostly about equity, STEM education, equity and policy. And so it was really good just to hear about the different uh, viewpoints and it, different representation in educators, higher ed. I represented somewhat like business sector, but also um, representing uh, just some, ex a little bit of experience here on the state board. So it was really a good, um, it was like a community conversations is what it called. So. Um, one of the things that Brian mentioned uh, with uh, United Way and then also Georgia and literacy, I think uh, when I look at a lot of the data that we look at um, in regards to literacy and, um, and Amy would say uh, the numbers haven't changed over years and years, I really think that it has to, the, the system that we have for education, we really have to go out in the community and really get the the community involved to really make some systemic changes. So I really thank you so much for bringing up United Way because uh, I have a really good relationship with them and I'm just gonna, I know they have some literacy programs. So because it's just not this Department of Ed or the education system can do this, if we really wanna see change. So this is what I, if I could take anything today right now, it would be that nugget, um, the community influence. So. Thank you. You know, it, it might be nice to do a, like a work session uh, and talking about kind of community partners and have community partners talk about what they're doing around literacy. Uh, we can have community foundation, we can have United Way. That might be something that we can maybe do for a work session because uh, we're always looking for ideas for work sessions. So that seems to be kind of something that we've been talking a lot about. So I'm just thinking maybe that might be something in the spring we could have them. A couple different groups kind of come and talk about um, from maybe different communities. You know, we could have um, Brian's group come in and then maybe, you know, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know, Central Iowa or something like that and talk about that. So, like, I even think about Brooke here and, and again, we want it to be statewide, but the partnership has done work in this space. I mean, there's even some businesses that this has been really important to them as well and have been advocates. Absolutely. Yeah, that, I think that'd be a awesome. idea. So, yeah. 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 So if you guys have ideas of people, maybe we could uh, start collecting those. So start thinking about that. And then uh, maybe if you guys could email me and just let me know um, anyone who you think you know who in this space has been doing work and then who would be willing to speak to us, maybe. I think that'd be great. Georgia? What am I supposed to give an update on, Brooke? Sorry. 
Oh, just anything that you've been doing, um, I guess, since our last meeting, um, like if you've gone to any meetings or anything like that, I guess, uh, education related, or if you, I don't know, I don't know, any, attended anything or spoke um, to any groups or anything like that. I have not. I'm sorry. Oh, oh that's totally fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. I mean, work. some people don't have a report. I mean, I've, I've had times where I don't have a report, you know. I can't get out of my work world, but I, because uh, <laughs> we're okay. going fast and furious over here, but I, I would just say I would agree with the comments that were made. Like I think of our employees in our stores right now, and uh, I'm going to echo the comments that were made around fatigue. I mean, our, you know, they're wearing masks all day long, eight day, six days a week, eight hours a day, and uh, just the same as teachers. I mean, I'm not saying our employees, but I'm just saying I appreciate the fatigue that was talked about earlier that um, I'm sure uh, teachers are getting and other um, administrative folks as well. It's just um, there's a lot, there's just a lot of stress around everything and everybody's trying to do their best. And then you have all the other ancillary things around you that you have to do to make it all work. And it, and it is, I think, creating fatigue and stress for those people who are kind of at the front lines every day. Um, so the comments that were made to just be thinking about our teachers and what are some of the things that we can be doing. I sent out an email earlier today, um, just to get feedback from our stores on what else can we be doing for our employees because we're going into the holidays and and all of this going on it's just i think that's uh was a really important message to to make and for us to all be thinking about um you know how can we be supportive of teachers and administrators right now plus you know we just came off the election and all the po politics around everything and everybody's getting under fire for every decision that they're making um, within the schools. And, you know, I always say to people, I 100%, I doubt that anybody is approaching this saying, okay, so today I'm gonna put a policy in place that is gonna be unhealthy for people and give the worst benefits to them, you know? And people are just being so not nice to our um, teachers, our administrators, our school board folks, who are trying to make all these decisions um, without a playbook in place and all with the mind of safety and security of our students and the employees. So, you know, anything that we can be doing to just bolster them during this time and help them understand that we understand that they're making some critical decisions and that we're supportive of them because it's just not, they're just under the fire. And I think social media is horrible for that. And that's all I got to say, Brooke. <laughs> Thanks, Georgia. I absolutely agree. You know, I think that, I mean, you're right. I mean, you know, essential workers, I mean, you know, it's, I, I know that I feel a lot of anxiety and I, I have the luxury of being able to work from home. I don't have to go into the office, you know, so that's, it's nice for me not to have to leave my home, but, you know, I still have a lot of anxiety about what's going on and, you know, my son's going to preschool and stuff like that. And, my husband is a central worker. He works at hospice, you know, they're at the 365 days a year and they can't just send everyone home, you know, so he has to go. And so I just, I, I think that when you're thinking about this, people, I mean, teachers and, you know, I mean, people that when I go to Target, you know, they're there, you know, high V. So I just think that we really need to do whatever we can to help those people get through. I know the holidays are coming up and it's going to be, it's going to be rough, I think, you know, so I think that I absolutely agree, you know, I think we all need to give ourselves and others some grace. <laughs> Is, uh, is Josh on the phone? Yep. Oh, there you are. Hey, Josh. Um, not really any meetings or anything. There just isn't any meetings other than Zooming everything. Um, but uh, probably the biggest thing education related wise is just, um, I've been very impressed with like our school districts around here and, and making things continue to happen as normal as possible, which is not easy. Um, you know, and, and there's definitely some benefits to living in a smaller rural area because we don't have, um, we don't have that, that same student population like you maybe would in the bigger district. And so we're able to incorporate more social distancing. We're able to do some things that maybe you couldn't accomplish at, at a bigger school district, which has been really valuable because our kids have been able to continue to go to school and even participate in some things to give them some sort of normalcy. So um we just this last weekend uh we had a mary poppins musical in town and we were able to continue to have the musical thursday night was half the parents were able to attend friday night the other half the parents were able to attend 
they canceled all the other um, performances, but then they, they videoed it and streamed it. And then people were able to, you know, purchase um, the online streaming and, and were able to stream it that way. So, you know, small little victory there. We're still able, still able to have that happen um, as a parent of a kid in the play. Like that's one of the biggest anxiety things. It's like, when you got kids involved in activities, you're like, is this going to happen? Like every day you're worried that the school is going to call and be like, oh, this is off. We're no longer going to do this. Um, so, you know, just that unknown is always an anxiety factor as well. Um, but I've been really impressed with the school and the administration and, and everybody and even the kids. I mean, so it's, it's weird because Osage um, won the state volleyball tournament. And they were still able to have the state volleyball tournament, which was amazing. Um, I actually attended one of the, uh, the days of the tournament and the state did a great job of, um, you know, making sure people wore masks. They were constantly wiping things down, cleaning things down. Um, everybody was socially distanced. Like, I think it couldn't have gone any better. Um, but what's interesting is our volleyball players as a group decided to uh, quarantine two weeks prior to state volleyball because they knew that they had a really good team and they had a chance. So they did remote learning and they all stayed healthy. They, they were committed to each other and to making sure that, you know, they didn't ruin this opportunity. Um, you know, our kids that were the, the leads in the play, they took two weeks off prior to the play and did remote learning in order to make sure that they were able to, you know, reap the rewards of all their hard work and, and learning their lines and doing all this stuff. So, you know, it's just, I've seen a lot of dedication out of our kids, out of our parents. Um, it's been pretty cool. Um, I got to brag a little bit. My, my seventh grade daughter's a little runner and um, we were able to still have the uh, middle school state cross country meet and she won the class 2A meet and shattered the record for class 2A. And like, that was awesome. But, but the thing is, it's like, we were so worried, you know, cause you got these, you got these experiences that you want for your kids and you got these experience, you want them to live as normal of an experience as they can and go to school and see their friends and do these activities. And so every time something like that happens, it's like a little win, you know, it's like a little bit of normalcy again. So, you know, kudos to all the administrators and everybody that's still trying so hard to give these kids some sort of normalcy. Cause like Hannah said, and George has alluded to, I mean, just the amount of stress out there on these kids. And of course they tear down the play on Saturday and, and everybody's wearing a mask except for when they all ate pizza. And so my daughter is sitting next to a girl that ends up testing positive for COVID. So my seventh graders in quarantine for two weeks now, but you know, it is what it is. But um, so we're going through that we're going through that right now, Brooke, of, okay, oh, yeah. where can she go in the house and who can she be close right? to? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, oh, but, sorry. But, so there's there's some wins out there. You know, I mean, it's, it's it, 2020 has been horrible and there's a lot of things that kids haven't been able to do, but we still get to celebrate some wins every now and then. And, and thanks to the adults and the parents and the administrators and teachers that are still allowing those wins to happen. So... We got to celebrate those little victories every now and then. I absolutely agree. I hope your daughter, um, I hope she's okay. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I came home last night from work and and her room was spotless. Um, <laughs> she's kind of stashed away some food and Gatorade in there. And she was playing Christmas music. So, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. We'll see how it is in a week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My daughter started doing that like two weeks ago oh. <laughs> on the Christmas music. And my husband's like, oh, please. <laughs> my, but we love it. <laughs> my, my oldest, my oldest two have already put up the Christmas tree. Oh, like, my daughter did too. Oh, wow. like two weeks ago. She's got a little Christmas tree in her. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. I, and then she said, mom, can we go to Target and shop for Christmas ornaments? And I'm like, yeah, can we get past Halloween? Cause I, they're not out. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Whatever keeps you occupied, right? Yep. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Mike? Two quick things. Um, uh, the community college and council us uh, hired a new president, and they had a very good process of uh, public forums with each of the three finalists. Uh, the last name of the president will not change. 
because it's Dan Kenny Jr. who is taking uh, Dr. Kenny's place. Um, also, last week I went to a meeting um, that described a partnership between Council of Schools and Iowa Western, which maybe it's happening throughout the state. Um, but the uh, school district actually put a counselor on the campus at Council uh, at Iowa Western. And starting with sophomores, students can attend the community college, get their high school diploma, and probably end up with some kind of certification or um, coursework that will allow them to do some other things. So it was interesting. Nice. Yeah. That's it. All right. <laughs> um, and mine are really quick. So I am no longer the uh, chair of the National Association of State Boards of Education, NASB. I am now the immediate past chair. So I get to serve for another year on the board. Um, and the conference um, was fantastic. I didn't, I presented like just an opening remarks at the orientation by the state for the whole time. Um, hopefully they'll be able to do the orientation in person next year. Um, they usually do it in June in DC. So hopefully, um, Brian and Georgia, since you guys didn't get to attend, you can attend in person next year. Hopefully if they can do that, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I thought the sessions were really great. Um, and I, especially Betty, I agree with you. That opening session was just absolutely fantastic. I was so excited for it and it did not disappoint. That was a pretty incredible session. So, um, and then uh, Ryan Weiss uh, reached out to me um, and as you all know, he's a former um, director of Department of Education. So now he's a Dean at uh, Drake um, School of Education. So he asked me to serve on the National Advisory Council for uh, Drake School of Education. So um, our first meeting is in beginning of December. So looking forward to that. That's all I have. So all right. So now it's 1225. So let's um, um, let, let's give um, we're going to need a little bit of time out. Do you want to eat while Davenport's presenting? Or I think that's eat? fine. Okay. Sure. I'm okay with that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we'll, yeah. let's turn it off until 1230 and we'll come back okay. and go get yeah. our food. Yeah.